stars as Dick Tracy, the comic strip hero, come to life in this summer's challenger to Batman. We'll be reviewing Dick Tracy and another 48 Hours, the new Eddie Murphy, Nick Nolte movie, on this edition of Siskel and Ebert. I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. And I'm Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune. And our first film is Warren Beatty's eagerly awaited film of Dick Tracy. And I was startled when I first saw it because this is not really, first and foremost, the story of a detective. Rather, it's a love story about a guy who happens to be a detective. Betty plays Tracy as a contemporary man without a square jaw, not like in the comic strip, but as a workaholic caught between two women, Tess Trueheart, the dutiful good woman, and the vampish, breathless Mahoney, a nightclub singer who comes on to Tracy hard when he visits her while investigating a crime. Madonna plays Breathless. I think Lips Manless is dead, and I want you to tell me who killed him. Or maybe you weren't on his side. Whose side are you on? Side I'm always on. Mine. No grief for lips? I'm wearing black underwear. You know, it's legal for me to take you down to the station and sweat it out of you under the lights. I sweat a lot better in the dark. The crime story in the film centers on mob boss Big Boy Caprice. Tracy's sworn enemy, played joyfully by Al Pacino. He looks like one of the Corleones crossed with Richard III and sounds like Pacino in Injustice for All. I'm looking for generals! What do I got? Foot soldiers! I want Dick Tracy dead! The film looks great, as in this shootout, which adds primary colors, blues, reds, yellows, and greens to a hail of bullets reminiscent of old Warner Brothers gangster films from the 30s. The film looks just great. The weakest link in it, however, for me is Warren Beatty as actor who plays a downsized, more contemporary Tracy, even though he's wearing period clothes, a yellow hat and coat. The film is glorious to look at and a true invention and individual performers, notably Pacino, are first rate. I just wish the crime story were a little tighter and that Beatty had played Tracy as more of a hero. Otherwise, it is a truly original creation. I just want to have one point here. First of all, I don't think yellow hats and coats are period clothes. I think that that period exists only in the Chester Gould comic strip that Dick Tracy is based on. Well, but okay. apart from that, Dick Tracy in the comics and in this movie is kind of uh, uh, something for the others to ricochet off of. Dick Tracy, to me, was always the least interesting character in the comic strip because he was always surrounded by these weird-looking, bizarre right. cre creatures. And one of the things that I really enjoyed about this movie is the use of makeup, especially in that opening poker scene and some of the other scenes where these really weird, strange looking people come along, like Dustin Hoffman playing Mumbles, right. or a big boy uh, Caprice. Caprice, whatever his name is. Yeah. The, the Al Pacino inside that makeup and inside that costume uh, really steals the show. It's a fabulous performance. But what I like most about the movie was how it creates an entirely different world for us to look at. And what I'd like to do right now is take a very specific look at Dick Tracy's original movie world. Let's look at a scene where Tracy follows the kid back to a tar paper shack he lives in with his sadistic mentor in crime. A scene that really shows off the special effects and art direction of the movie. What we're looking at here is a completely artificial creation that exists only within a movie studio and only within the imaginations of the people who made this film. This is not a real city. These are not real buildings. That's not a real horizon. These are not real interiors. These are not real exteriors. Nothing in this entire movie from beginning to end exists anywhere except in the imagination of Warren Beatty and the people that he's put together as a team to create this movie. The art director, the visual effects people, the uh, optical illusion people, the mad artists, everyone in this movie has worked together in order to create a, a new universe that doesn't exist anywhere except in Dick Tracy. Maybe we should step outside. Ever since I first started going to the movies as a kid, I've always loved films that go to the trouble of creating a completely new and original world for their stories to take place in. Even if it was only a movie about gigantic grasshoppers and you could see that they were only knocking over cardboard skyscrapers, that was fun for me because the whole movie was made up. And that is the special quality and the special innocence of Dick Tracy, that the sets, the costumes, 
the primary colors, the backdrop, the makeup, the special effects all take us into this new world that we've never seen before. Well, it reminds me of uh, Robert Altman's creation for the movie Popeye, where it was more physical set building that yeah. was truly spectacular and created a world. Uh, I liked in that film, I like Robin Williams' Popeye. Mm -hmm. Here, I didn't care for Beatty's Tracy, and I'm wondering what you think about that. Uh, I think I know what you mean, and that the character is not real dynamic, and the character is not really out there. It's almost as if Tracy is the brunt of the plot, and he's the victim of everybody that's trying to pull him this way and pull him that way. Maybe you would have preferred a Tracy who was a little more active. Well, would you? I Yes, absolutely. Uh, the movie I mean, is exactly as it's made, and it seems well, to me that it, they, they all are. Yeah, yeah, it works fine this way for me. You know, yeah, I wanted a guy. I wanted a guy to take a little charge. He's insecure. He seems to be more contemporary. It seems to be more about Warren Beatty than it is about the guy. Well, in the but that's trip. legitimate. I mean, I think maybe it's that, legitimate. That's I just why don't Warren Beatty wanted to make this movie. I just don't maybe think it's that interesting for that on that aspect. I still think the picture is extraordinary as a creation of film. Okay, coming up next, Torn Apart, a love story set in the Middle East, and later in the show. Another 48 hours with Nick Nolte and Eddie Murphy at war with crooks and with each other. Now, I wouldn't want to get killed by a stray bullet that was meant for you. Now, that'd be a hell of a way to go, wouldn't it be? Our next film is called Torn Apart, and it stars Adrian Pastar as a free-thinking young Israeli soldier who tries to maintain a love relationship with a young Arab woman, Cecilia Peck, who lives on the West Bank. The film has a noble goal to argue for loving together as a start for other people to live together, but the script is so pedestrian, the syrupy musical soundtrack so phony that Torn Apart never seems real in a world that we know is all too real. For example, when Pastar tries to approach her years after they have met as children, now that he's back in Israel from America. This is not America. You forget I don't are. forget. I know exactly where I am, and I also know we should be friends. And we can't be again. I could be killed for just speaking to you. Later, she challenges him about his role in keeping West Bank Arabs in line while working as a soldier. How can you serve in an occupying army? I don't believe this. You don't know a thing about me. I know what you are. No. You don't. You know what I do. Not how I feel. Not how any of us feel. The Arab point of view is presented by the girl's father, who disapproves of her friendship. In our society, everything, everything is against such a situation. The difference between us, Arab and Jew, were not so easily torn away, not even from you. And then there's the Israeli lad, stern father, played by Barry Primus, who chastises his son for being careless with his rifle while on patrol. I understand. You were trying to save a life. What would you have done? In your situation? Yeah. I'd have let the boy drown. Great. That's right. And I say it as a man with two children. I'm a human being. But first, you're a soldier. You don't leave your damn gun for the Arabs to shoot your friends with. Torn Apart certainly means well, but inasmuch as I didn't believe a single principal character, they seem much too written and too archetypal, I ended up enjoying Torn Apart only for its shots of the Israeli landscape. I suppose one could rent a travelogue video instead and do just as well. You're right on the money there. I mean, uh, it's interesting to see Israel. It's interesting to see the interaction of the soldiers with the civilian population, both Israeli and... Because uh, normally we just see newsreels, and, and so yeah, it is fresh yeah, to see yeah, another cam yeah. a more objective camera. But not only didn't I believe any of the characters, I had a fundamental physical difficulty that should have been dealt with by the casting director. This movie opens showing some kids in 1967 who I would guess are supposed to be 10 or maybe 12 or, or 11 years old I'm not sure right and then we flash forward six years and we get the two characters you saw uh, in those right. clips uh, Cecilia Peck and uh, Adrian Pastar they look much much older than 17 low 20 they look well I, low mid 20s yeah they're, they look there was such a gap that I spent it I lost at least 10 minutes of this movie saying to myself are those supposed to be the same people? You know, are those yeah. are those the people we saw earlier? Right. Or not? And then when I when I finally recovered from that, then I realized that the first opening shot of the movie had given away the ending, right. basically, That's true. so that I could predict everything that was going to happen. True. And so even though it had all these good intentions, it didn't have any any reason to be interested. Well, I mean, you know, they could have altered the years a little bit and maybe have solved that one problem. But I'm telling you that the characters, as written and played, mm -hmm. uh, are. Phony. And this is a world that we know 
real well. And I'm saying if you're going to play in this territory, you better write it straight. Because we, we have, you know, the daily news reports out of yeah, there of what uh, these people uh, are like. Yeah, it was a little bit of too much of Romeo and Juliet, yes. wasn't it? Where love is going to conquer all and love is not going to conquer all and love doesn't conquer all. Coming up next, Eddie Murphy is an ex-con and Nick Nolte is a cop in another 48 hours. You pulled my car! It's a damn shame. Okay, next movie. And our next movie is Another 48 Hours, which is not so much a sequel as a film in the same tradition as the original 48 Hours, which came out in 1982 and made Eddie Murphy into an overnight movie star. As this new movie opens, Nick Nolte is still one of the sloppiest cops in San Francisco, and Eddie Murphy is one of the more fastidious cons. Murphy is getting out of prison, and Nolte is there to meet him because Nolte believes Murphy may hold the key to a lot of his problems. I'm going to lose my badge. They're going to put me in jail. Well, you're in trouble with the law this time. Good. Good. As bad as I feel about you keeping my money, that almost makes me feel better. Now I'm sure I don't want to go with you. Wait a minute, damn it. I don't beg. You're going to shoot me out here in front of the prison? It's not a very good way to treat the best leads you ever had. Don't worry, I'll come visit you about five or six years. The bus trip doesn't turn out so well after the bus is attacked by a couple of killer motorcycle riders. Both Nolte and Murphy wind up in the hospital. I'm broke, I've been shot at, I was in a bus that flipped over 20 times, had glass all in my hair and all over my suit, broke my Walkman and lost my James Brown tape. So leave me alone, okay, Jack? Well, life's tough, Reggie. I ran into your friends, too, today. They shot me in the chest six times. Well, you don't look bad for a dead person. Well, I would be if it wasn't for one of these. If you remember the first movie, you remember that Noldy agreed to take care of Murphy's sports car while he was in prison. It's been parked on the street ever since. Man, how could you leave my car outside all these years? Why'd you put it in the... Garage, look at that dirt all over it. What if somebody stole it? Yeah, I had a lot put on it. Yeah. Maybe this push this blue button right there. You have no appreciation whatsoever for what's happening. That's what it is. You don't know that that car is flying. Sometimes you get a sequel that really tries to improve on the original. Lethal Weapon 2 was a movie like that. Sometimes, though, you get a sequel that simply wants to exploit the original success. And that is the case with Another 48 Hours. The movie starts with a very badly confused screenplay, a story so hard to follow that at some point, they simply go to a convict who's still in prison and say, who is this guy? And the convict says, here's his name and here's his address. And they say, thanks very much. That's the only way they could write themselves out of that corner. And then the movie goes very light on the best elements of the first film, which was the relationship between Nolte and Murphy. Instead, there are a lot of shadowy bad guys and endless fight scenes, one of which probably sets a modern-day record for the amount of glass that people are throwing through, at, or upon. And to that, you add movie cliches so overworked that this is actually the second Nick Nolte movie in two months where he's called on the carpet by the internal affairs investigators. Another 48 Hours is a real disappointment. You know, uh, some people don't believe that I don't know what you're going to say and review. And they, like, we rehearsed this show. Uh -huh. You didn't tell, you didn't, had no evaluative remarks before you started showing the clips from the That's movie. That's right. No, and I then didn't. you started to make a complimentary comparison to Lethal Weapon 2, I thought. Uh -huh. And I was panic-stricken, because if you like, this picture is so bad. <laughs> I mean, I was so relieved. Uh, so I have to express I'm that. Glad, I'm glad I didn't want now to cause you any anxiety. Now I can talk. Yes, okay. And and it's shockingly bad. And I'm stunned that a film company and creative people would throw away, simply for personal monetary reasons, throw away a franchise like this picture, like the relationship between these two guys. That's money in the bank. Mm -hmm. If you just let these guys talk to each other and have some kind of relationship, why do you want to put these two guys and run them through a treadmill of bar fights and broken glass? I don't understand it. I, I mean, I'm just, I'm flabbergasted that they would do that. Eddie Murphy walks out in a suit, self-contained like a machine, is not given time uh, to, to develop a character, to even extemporize, it seems. Yeah, it, people don't remember the original movie. It was eight years ago. That's a whole, that's a century in movie terms. The target audience for this movie hardly remembers the first film, unless they saw it on video. And, and Nolte, who is a wonderful actor, and we're going to take a look at some of his uh, other films right now on video that are <laughs> infinitely better, what is he given to do? He basically holds Murphy's hand through this picture. You know, I was stunned. I, I don't want to just seem like I'm always giving the same review of Eddie Murphy because my job is not to be a career doctor. But here is a man who is, by his very nature, destined to be and is a superstar. And there is nothing that he could not have if he exercises quality control. He is not being handled well 
uh, or in handling terms of himself his well. films, or handling himself well. He is making one bad, sloppy, ill-written, ill-conceived, ill-thought-out movie after another, as if his magic is going to carry it through, you know, and it ain't going to happen. I stared at I stared at him. I stared at both of them. I must say. I mean, I don't know. You know, Nolte's there for the ride. I apparently, but I wondered. I just said, what's the appeal of the script? Coming up next, a look at two of Nick Nolte's best performances. He can do better than this, a lot better than this, and they're available on home video. Did you know those guys? Yeah, I used to. And now, after the debacle of another 48 hours, it's time for a special video tribute to Nick Nolte, who has done much better before in his career. For younger moviegoers, there is a lot more to this fine actor than you get to see in another 48 hours. One of my favorite Nick Nolte films on tape, the great movie about pro football, North Dallas 40. And I also like Under Fire, in which Nolte plays a risk-taking freelance photographer who schemes to break a story on a rebel leader in Nicaragua. The translator from the hotel. You're looking for Rafael? Yeah, it's possible. How'd you know? Mr. Price doesn't do anything before announcing it first to the whole world. It's a good story. Nolte's special skill is his earthy honesty. He seems like a salt-of-the-earth type, but he's not a hayseed. In all of his films, and especially here, he's a salt-of-the-earth type who now lives in the big city and knows it cold. And that is what is distinguishing about him. He, Gene Hackman, you feel, is a resident of rural America. Mm -hmm. Nolte is the same solid type, but a city guy, a city street guy. You know, one of the neat things about Nick Nolte is how quickly he developed uh, from beginnings that seemed a little shaky. He started out on uh, a miniseries in television in the 1970s as kind of just another good-looking hunk. And it wasn't long before people could no longer dismiss him and put him into that category because he played one good character role after another. And that's been the key to his career, is finding interesting characters to play and developing as an actor. One of my favorite Nick Nolte movies is Down and Out in Beverly Hills, right. in which he plays a completely degenerate bum from Skid Row who manages to move into this household and take right over. But my choice of Nick Nolte's best film is actually a 1978 film. It's called Who'll Stop the Rain? And it stars Nolte as a returning Vietnam veteran who gets talked by a friend into trying to smuggle some heroin back into the country and gets in a whole lot of trouble as a result. When he gets to the States, he hooks up with a friend's wife, played by Tuesday Weld, but then they find themselves trapped in the middle of a dangerous situation they know very little about. You ever seen these guys before? No. Who are they? Mommy. They're takeoff artists. That's who they are. Who'll Stop the Rain is based on Dog Soldiers by Robert Stone, which is one of the best American novels I've read in my lifetime. For Nolte, the movie was an important transition. He was a star at, at this point in 1978, but he hadn't yet convinced anybody he could do serious dramatic acting. This movie proved that for once and for all. He's a special actor uh, in Q&A. He takes the, with his... Which his is film. out right now. Yeah, in theaters. That film, I think he takes the risk of really playing someone who is unlikable, has mm -hmm. very little redeeming features. I know he's supposed to be a good cop who's, uh, you know, on the take and all that, but he's really a vulgar kind of character, racist uh, to the core, mm -hmm. and I, I really admire an actor when they do that, and they so much want to be liked, mm -hmm. and Nolte hasn't really ever done that. He's never really indulged himself in wanting to be liked. He hasn't smiled at the audience and said, please like me please be glamorous he'll get down and dirty in a film and i admire him for it i do too let's take another look at the movies we reviewed on this program two thumbs up for dick tracy with its wonderfully original comic strip world and a galaxy of supporting characters gene would have preferred a stronger dick tracy though two thumbs down for torn apart the relentlessly predictable love story set in israel and two more downturn thumbs way down for another 48 hours a disappointment for us and a wasted opportunity for Nick Nolte and Eddie Murphy. So, Dick Tracy. Dick Tracy. And another thing I'd like to say about Dick Tracy, there's not a single four-letter word in this movie. There's not a single drop of blood. People get shot like they're Swiss cheese. This, you know, last year, so many kids went to see Batman, and I thought it was such a dark and relentless and pessimistic and violent vision. I think Dick Tracy is much more suitable for younger viewers. Well, now, let's talk about the age. I don't, the little ones, I don't know if they're going to Get they it. won't get it. No, no. I, I'm. You're, what you're talking about is ten and up, or maybe something like something that. Something like that. And I think that I think it's true. What uh, I would hope to translate to kids, and maybe uh, parents will explain it to them, is 
what they're looking at is really ma kind of magical in a visual way. That would I would hope that kids would know that, Gene. Well, I don't say. know. They see so much TV. Okay, kids, now this is magical. They don't see, they don't see this. I don't know if they have a reference point to it because they're constantly seeing this TV well, crap. Maybe so. I don't know. <laughs> okay, that's it for this week. Next week, a special <laughs> show on the phenomenon of Arnold Schwarzenegger. He talks funny, he looks different, and yet he's become one of the top movie stars in the world today. Who are you? Oh, I'm Vincent's brother. We're twins. His success is surprising. That's why we're calling this show Schwarzenegger, the unlikeliest star. You got a lot of nerve showing your face around here, Hauser. Look who's talking. But that's next week. And until then, the balcony is closed. Snow caps, raisinets, and goobers. Three big box office hits starring Nestle Milk Chocolate. Moviegoers give them a definite two thumbs up. Shout now, wash later with Power Stick Shout. In tests against the other stick, shout one out two to one. Want tough stains out? Choose Power Stick Shout. Safer, effective pesticides for use in the garden, the home, and on pets. Designed with the environment in mind. Murder on bugs, but not on us. We're safer. Inverness One Touch Roll On Waxer. Removes hair for weeks at a time and leaves skin smooth and silky. From the hair removal specialists, Inverness.